All right, well, it is six o'clock on the dot. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the Common Forest Insects and Diseases webinar. Thank you so much for joining us either on Zoom or live at Glacier Brewing. Uh, tonight, we are joined by DNRC entomologist, Amy Gannon, who will be talking about insects and diseases of Northwest Montana forests. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you all know that you are all muted and your cameras are off for those on Zoom. And if at any time you have questions for Amy, please type them into the Q&A chat box, and that'll either be at the bottom or the top of your screen. Um, we'll be taking all questions at the very end. And for those of you at the brewery, uh, give your questions to Sarah or Heidi, and they'll type them in for you. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so Amy can start. Hi, everyone. Um, let's see. Looks like it is sharing. And I'm trying to get it into, here we go. Looks good on my end. Thumbs up if it looks good on your end, Abby. Yeah, looks great. Great, okay. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I remember doing this in person with Tim Beebe last year at the brewery, and I have to say that was a pretty nice arrangement, um, but I appreciate that we're able to do this in a virtual format. I think that's really um, nice that we can still do this kind of work in strange times. So um, I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes, and I realize I don't have a timepiece, so please interrupt me if I just keep going for too long. Um, yeah. And... Uh, is around and I'm going to just give kind of an overview on insects and diseases in general, like things that you may encounter, but I'm really going to focus on some Doug fir maladies because that's a lot of what's happening in Lake County right now. Um, but just as an overview, I just want to remind everybody that forests are dynamic. A lot of us know this, but it's hard to realize like when we have a certain view of our forest that yes, indeed, they do change and they are constantly changing. Um, you know, with storms, there's a big windstorm in the northwest part of the state this, in the last couple of years. So there's a lot of storm damage from that. Um, fires are definitely a common agent of change that everybody in Montana is aware of. I'm specifically talk about insects and diseases as an agent of change. And insects and diseases are a typical part of an ecosystem, the forest ecology in Montana. But sometimes it interferes with what we want from our forest. We have certain objectives. Um, maybe it's just, you know, aesthetically, we want some green, beautiful forests of a certain size that are on the landscape, or maybe we're producing fiber or timber or maybe wildlife habitat. Um, so all those things, when we have certain objectives that are interrupted by um, insects or diseases, then we regard them as pests. And insects and disease come into a bunch of different categories. Um, I'm going to talk about both insects and diseases, even though I'm more trained as an entomologist, so I may be biased to speak a little bit more about insects, but I'm going to try to do, um, do some co cover some diseases as well. But insects, everyone's familiar with bark beetles. Um, we all know about bark beetles, but wood borers are also active in Montana forests. Um, they can be moths and beetles. Um, we have defoliators that feed on the needles of trees. Terminal weevils, you'll see those in the Colorado blue spruce that are planted in landscapes when the top kind of bends over. Those are often terminal weevils. I'm not going to talk about those much. And aphids and scales are like little flecks that are on the bark of the tree or on needles. We also see those quite a bit. I'm not going to spend much time talking on those just because it's a 30 minute presentation. We typically spend three days talking about all of these. Some disease categories, root and butt rots, um, huge impact in Montana and quite per um, pervasive and common, some rusts that get onto trees that we'll talk about. You can also see some stem rusts, um, stem diseases, foliar diseases, diseases that just affect the needles, and dwarf mistletoes. I'll talk about those. All of these have different impacts. So some diseases and insects kill the tree outright and it happens fast. Some take a long time and they just compromise the tree. So we'll talk about some of those differing impacts. Just because something's in your trees doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be, you know, your trees are gone or bark beetles are one of those organisms. So that do have a pretty tremendous impact on the trees. They will kill them outright. So they work by boring into the tree. They're tiny, tiny little insects about the size of a grain of cooked rice. And they mass attack a tree. They feed on the inner bark and they girdle the circulatory system of the tree. 
Furthermore, they introduced some blue stain, which is in that lower picture. You see that perimeter of stain, that's actually a fungus that's introduced that further um, interferes with the circulatory system of the tree and effectively suffocates it. And it kills the tree outright. There are a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, bark beetles that we talk about in Montana kill the tree outright once they're successful in mass attacking. Um, it takes about a year though for the trees to fade. See those pine trees in the upper picture? Those trees were probably attacked in the summer and then by the following um, year is when the crowns actually turn red. And a lot of times these bark beetles are associated with root disease and drought, damage from storms or fire. They oftentimes get the credit for killing the tree and being the agent or mortality, but a lot of times there's an underlying factor. In this picture here, those trees don't look so hot. There's a lot going on. The bark beetles aren't really what is the st main stress on those trees. They're just what killed the tree ultimately, but there's root disease in that site, plenty of it. And those trees were struggling along and then those bark beetles just kind of finished it off. Bark beetles are not actually that hard to identify. They all look very similar to the naked eye, but there's a lot of telltale signs where you can identify which bark beetles in the tree. And the first thing is to know what species of tree you're dealing with. So if you have dug fir, for example, there's a pretty good likelihood that the bark beetle in the tree is dug fir beetle. Um, so just knowing what species of tree you have first and foremost is really helpful in figuring out what kind of bark beetle you're dealing with. Um, the, once you peel away the bark by taking a hatchet and hatcheting into the tree and pulling the bark away, um, you will see these distinct galleries under the bark and they make a very particular pattern and you can find these patterns on the internet or in um, identification books that match with what's there and that's how you can tell what beetles at play. In Montana, we have quite a few bark beetles. This is just a fraction of the bark beetles that exist. These are the ones that we talk about the most often. Um, pretty much everybody in Montana knows mountain pine beetle because we had a really incredible outbreak um, between 1999 and the year 2015, where about um, 6 million acres of uh, forest in Montana had bark be uh, mountain pine beetle of some degree. Some of it was pretty heavy, like quite a bit of mortality and some some of those acres were just a few trees here and there that got hit. We have pine engraver and red turpentine beetle. Red turpentine beetle looks a lot like mountain pine beetle, but it's only the, the lower six feet of the tree. And um, it actually doesn't really kill the tree. And then we have some other pine bark beetles, Douglas fir beetle, uh, spruce beetle. And you can tell that a lot of the trees um, have a corresponding beetle with them. I'm gonna focus on Douglas fir beetle because Doug fir beetle is actually quite on the rise, especially in the Northwest part of the state. There's been a lot of fire activity, blowdown, and also just drought stress. And so throughout the host range of Doug fir, we're seeing Doug fir beetle uh, and it's just on the rise. It's mostly in Doug fir, although you can sometimes find it in larch and it'll develop in larch that is, below, is down. Um, but for the most part, it's ex um, exclusively in Doug fir. It tends to hit the trees that are really large and mature, which typically are the trees that we really desire um, in a lot of ways for wildlife habitat and they're just big and stately and enjoyable. Um, but trees that are really big and mature like that tend to get hit by Doug fir beetle. Trees that have been stressed by fire or drought, there's a lot of trees on our landscape that have these factors kind of playing against them or trees that are really densely spaced. Um, they're really competing with each other for light water and nutrients, so they're not really vigorous and dug for beetle can get into trees that are not really that vigorous. They also really hit trees um, pretty commonly that have root disease. A lot of times I go into stands where I think there's a dug for beetle outbreak, but really in truth, the underlying issue is root disease, particularly our malaria, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, identifying dug for beetle. Um, those of you that are familiar with identifying mountain pine beetle, this is a bit different. Mountain pine beetle has those little wads of pitch that are on the tree, not dug fir beetle. Dug fir beetle has this reddish brown boring dust that's all up and down the tree. And it's really persistent even after the snows in the winter. You can blow away the snow and still see it uh, in the bark crevices in the spring. And so you'll sign that bright orange dust. Sometimes it's kind of a darker brown. And then underneath the bark, if you peel away the bark, you'll find these galleries and they're pretty distinct in Doug fir beetle. 
because the female lays some eggs on the left side and then she'll lay some eggs on the right side. And so it makes this kind of feathered pattern uh, in the gallery going up the bark. Um, but really, if you see just a long vertical gallery that's packed with frass and dug fur, it's probably dug fur beetle. And this is like the most beautiful picture of a Doug for a beetle gallery. Um, I think this is a Ken Gibson picture. Sandy Kegley from the Forest Service took this. This is really what you're gonna see. You're not gonna see this, you know, a textbook gorgeous example. But like I said, you'll see that long central gallery with those larval galleries going off. And that's Doug for a beetle. It doesn't have to be pretty. Managing Doug for a beetle with, along with a lot of the bark beetles is really, it's important to think about what are your long-term goals? What are your plans in the future? Um, what are some of the future outbreaks that you might have in your stand? And really think about that. Instead of just chasing around trees that are infested and trying to take care of things here and there, it's better to think big picture um, because it takes a lot of effort to manage uh, your forest. And so you wanna have the most bang for your buck. So silviculture is mostly the, one of the number one recommendations. And silviculture is just to manage the vegetation. It's how you manage the vegetation to change the conditions in the forest. And I'll go through each of these in more detail. You can also use chemical preventives. We'll talk about some pheromones that are similar to chemical preventives. And then we'll also talk a little bit about trapping. So with silviculture, you're gonna manage the vegetation. You're really gonna thin the vegetation um, and increase the vigor of the residual trees. When you space out the trees, the trees that are left behind are gonna have more access to water and light and nutrient resources. You can also pull out the trees that are infested. So with beetles. So in the case of the Doug fir beetle, you'll look for trees that are still green in the crowns and that they have the boring dust. And then you go with your hatchet and pull away the bark and see that there's some larvae or eggs underneath the bark. Those are the trees that you remove. You're really gonna need to make sure you treat those trees. You can't just cut them down and lay them down because the beetles will continue to develop and then they'll emerge the next year and hit their, the uh, surrounding trees. Bark beetles have a one-year life cycle for the most part. Doug fir beetle has a one-year life cycle. So it'll hit the trees. I guess I took out my life cycle photo. I didn't mean to, but they'll hit the trees in the spring. So like about mid-May is when they fly and find new trees and attack them. Then they hit those new trees, they lay their eggs, and the eggs develop um, over the summer, and then they overwinter as adults. And then the uh, insects are adults under the bark, and then when we get to warm temperatures in the spring, they emerge by like April 15th. So they spent their one year, I mean, May 15th, they'll have spent their one year under the tree and then they'll emerge and look for new trees. Um, you can remove susceptible trees. If you're in the spot where that's gotten really hit with fire and your trees are scorched or trees are really big and old and you wanna remove some trees but don't know which ones, you could consider taking the large ones or the fire scorched ones um, because they will be most susceptible to the bark beetles. You can also promote trees that are different, different than the bark beetles want. So like in the case of Doug fir beetle, if you can promote larch or ponderosa pine in your stand, then when the Doug fir beetle outbreak happens, you'll still have some trees that are green and in, in, on the landscape that aren't hit by the bark beetles. You can also diversify the age class. Doug fir beetle really likes some of the larger trees, nine inches in diameter, but especially the 14 inch and greater. So having young Doug fir or young age classes of pine, if you're, in an, if you're concerned about mountain pine beetle. So having some young trees, some old trees. The other thing you can do is alter the microclimate. Mm. When you thin a stand, it takes a while for those residual trees to rebound and have more resources and be more robust. But when you thin, you immediately alter the microclimate. And the insects really depend upon chemical messages to navigate and find trees, find host trees, find mates, mass attack. And when you open up that stand, you're increasing the wind that goes through the stand and dispersing that chemical message. And so it impacts how successful the insects are in getting to those um, and to finding trees and mass attacking. And also when you're looking at removing some trees in general with silviculture, and this is more with um, defoliators, but retaining trees that look really good, that have pointed tops, that look like they're still putting on a lot of growth and increment is really a valuable consideration. 
You can also do preventive sprays. This is more effective with mountain pine beetle. Um, it's a little bit difficult with spruce beetle and dug fir beetle just based on the architecture of the tree. It's hard to get into the main bowl. But the point is that you have to get there before the beetles get onto the tree because it's just to prevent attack. It doesn't affect the beetles when they're leaving the tree. Um, and so you wanna apply it before the beetles fly. So you wanna know the timing of the beetles. And I definitely recommend getting a certified applicator, partly because you need to get up to a pretty small caliper of the tree. And most people that have hard home and garden kind of applicator equipment don't have the power to get up into that small caliper, like a five inch caliper of the tree. Also, you can have a lot of non-target impacts. These chemicals are, can effectively kill the bark beetles when they're going into the tree, but they can also kill some other insects as well. Um, and the, it depends on what situation you're in. So if you have a tree in a yard, there are certain things that are labeled versus something that's in a forest, there are different chemicals that are labeled and you need to make sure you're using the correct one. Pheromones are another way to prevent beetle attack. Um, bark beetles communicate with chemical messages. And so they use those chemical messages called pheromones to locate a tree. Well, those are more terpenes, but locate a tree, mass attack. So like one tiny beetle isn't gonna overcome those trees natural defenses, which is pressurized resin and moisture. So they need lots of beetles to overcome the tree, like 2,000 2, beetles in a tree about that size. They need these chemical messages to find mates. And they also need these messages to limit the density in a tree. They want to mass attack a tree to kill the tree, but there's also a limit to how many beetles that tree can successfully support. So at some point, those beetles send out a chemical message that's essentially an anti, uh, no vacancy. It's an anti-aggregation pheromone. And those pheromones are used, they've been isolated and um, synthesized and they're species specific and they're used as a natural repellent. So that's the pheromones. In the case of um, Doug fir beetle, there's MCH, methylcyclohexanone. Um, it's commonly called MCH or some people call it beetle block and it has an EPA registration, so it's treated like a pesticide. It's only effective against Douglas fir beetle. There may be other beetles on the label, but it's really only effective against Douglas fir beetle. It only lasts for one season, but that's okay because the beetles are only going to be flying for a short amount of time. So we recommend getting these hung by April 15th. Don't hang it much earlier. Don't hang it much later. Do you want them hung by April 15th? And then it's a it's out there kind of creating a plume of no vacancy message. And so that will repel the beetles when they're looking for host trees. It's typically around mid-May, but sometimes it's a little earlier or later. Um, and you can either do a landscape scale treatment, you can put 33 per acre, or you can put two to four per tree. And it's just purely a matter of economics, whichever one is cheaper, it works about the same. And sometimes on the label, it says to get it up 12 feet up in the tree, but truly you can just get it up about six feet in the tree and then the tree when it heats up will carry it up like a plume, uh, like a chimney, and it'll be really effective against um, repelling the beetles even as they attack higher up in the tree. And then there's also another one that's for mountain pine beetle, it's verbenone. It's a little bit less effective than MCH. This is just for mountain pine beetle. You really need to remove any nearby infested trees though if you're gonna use uh, verbenone to repel mountain pine beetle. And it's not effective against Western pine beetle. So it's important to know what beetles you have in the area if you have mountain pine beetle. I've been getting a lot of calls lately about um, mountain pine beetle, but in fact, it's Western pine beetle that's in Ponderosa pine west of the continental divide and, and, and verbenone is not effective against it. You can also trap. I don't recommend this really for dug fir beetle unless you're being really, you have a really unique circumstance and you're really able to just pull the beetles out of a stand. But the theory is that you can bait traps and draw the beetles from the infested forest and pull them into the traps. The problem is spillover because sometimes the beetles fly towards the trap, fly right by the trap and hit an adjacent tree or a nearby tree. Um, so you can really make a pretty big mess with the trapping with these traps. They're really effective for like pine engraver, spruce beetle, uh, have had some luck. I've even used them with fur engraver. Um, you can also draw insects to trap logs. So if you know you're going to pull 
trees out of the stand or that you're able to, you can lay down a freshly cut tree, you know, willingly entice the beetles into that tree. And once that tree is infested, you can pull it out. There are also wood boring beetles on the landscape that often get confused with bark beetles. Um, Pine Sawyer beetle, this one with the long antennae is really common, especially in trees that are dead and dying. If you like to camp, sometimes if you're in an area where there's some dead and dying trees, you can hear these actually chewing at night. Um, there's some other flat-headed fir borer, which we're seeing a lot in the tops of larch in the northwest part of the state. And ponderous borers, like the one that looks like a giant cockroach um, that you can pull out, it has a really pretty large grub. They're not um, particularly aggressive beetles, so they don't hit trees that are otherwise healthy. Um, they're hitting trees that are dead and dying. Um, it looks like maybe I'm getting some stuff in the, oh, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna ignore the chat for a little bit. And they have pretty large exit holes. There's also some moths that get into the trees, into the base of the trees. And you've probably seen this with these copious amounts of pitch near the base, um, with the pitch moth. And they can be, you know, create quite a bit of pitch and look like they're gonna kill the tree, but a lot of times the trees can survive. And they're at the base and the crooks of trees as well. But it is alarming to see that. A lot of times you can go in there with a sharp knife and actually dig out the larva and they're pretty chunky larvae. Defoliators is another class of insect. That's not my picture and I should have properly credited on the bottom. It's a beautiful picture of a dug for a tussock moth and I got that off of forestry images. Um, but defoliators feed on the needle. So they don't kill the tree outright, but they do limit the tree's ability to produce um, sugars and it's their, reducing their photosynthetic um, capacity. And so you will, over time, on a mature tree, you'll get some branch dieback, you'll get some top kill. Some of the little trees in the understory that don't have much in the way of a carbohydrate reserve, they'll just die. They won't be able to live in the understory if they get really heavily denuded. Um, and sometimes it can predispose the trees to bark beetles as well, because the, tr the trees will get stressed. Um, we have quite a few different kinds in Montana. I'm gonna talk about spruce budworm and Doug fir tussock moth. Cause, and I'm, I'm not sure if I have large case bear in here, but if I do, I'll, I'll touch on that briefly as well. So spruce budworm is a bit of a misnomer. Yes, it will hit spruce, but we're really mostly seeing it in true firs, like grand fir and subalpine fir and Doug fir, a lot of it in Doug fir. Um, they're pretty messy feeders. A lot of times you'll see the needles kind of with some frass in there and some um, silk. They prefer really warm, dry sites and multi-storied stands. And the key about multi-storied stand is that the insects actually go up to the tops of the trees, they send out a little silk, and then they flutter down. If they land on the forest floor, they're gonna end up getting consumed by mice or spiders, beetles, ants. But if they land on another dug fir tree, then they'll just continue feeding and reproducing and perpetuating the population. Um, and it's really chronic in some areas, like around Helena and Bozeman and in areas in between and Georgetown Lake. We see it year after year after year to some level, um, you know, maybe a few years of reprieve in there. In the northwest part of the state, including Lake County, we do see periods of outbreak and then nothing, and then a period of outbreak. So it's a little bit more periodic. They're really distinct larvae. Um, that one right there, maybe I should have zoomed in a bit but you can see two rows of cream colored dots on the back. Um, and there's only two insects in Montana that will have that. One is pine budworm, which is pretty limited in distribution. It's like around Hall and Phillipsburg is where we mostly see it. Um, or the otherwise it's spruce budworm. And you'll also see these pupil cases and they look so delicate and they're glued to the needle of a, on the tree and they're really persistent. Like this picture was taken in the winter and they, you can see it almost any time of year. And then you'll see quite a bit of silk. Sometimes if you're riding horses or on a bike or hiking through the woods, you'll get it all in your face. Uh, it can be quite a nuisance. And the trees look kind of scorched. It'll be from the outside in, will be uh, kind of browning. Dug for tussock moth feeding also looks really similar to spruce budworm. And many times you can get both insects in the same tree. And again, these are dug fur. You'll see these a lot in dug fur and true furs. Um, 
The distribution of Doug for tussock moth is a bit limited, which is interesting because the female doesn't fly. So they don't go very far. She's got kind of, you know, she just falls out of her pupil case, sends out a sex pheromone, mates, lays her eggs, dies. That's, that's the geographic range of her life. Um, so they're limited to like Thompson Falls and Plains area, Columbia Falls. Um, we'll see it all along the Flathead Lake, Jetty Lake especially. And we've seen quite an outbreak, especially this last year in Missoula. Um, I know there's been outbreaks elsewhere um, and that's less notable because they are historically having outbreaks uh, like around Kalispell, but Missoula, we don't typically see that much of it. And we saw quite a bit the last couple of years. And it can be a uh, human health issue as well. There's a lot of hairs on these insects and they can cause um, lung irritation and skin irritation and it can be pretty severe. And they're really furry. So that upper picture is a really furry caterpillar, kind of cute if you're not allergic to them. Um, but yeah, they're pretty and they're really, really distinct. There's another one called rusty tussock moth that you might see. Um, and they, they can overlap quite a bit. Um, but usually if you see these on the tree, it's dug for tussock moth. And you will see the egg masses, which is on that lower picture. You will see them everywhere. Um, you'll see them just on the, the nodes, like the branch crooks of the trees. You'll see them on the main stem. Um, you'll see them on houses, lawn furniture, everything. Um, and they typically defoliate the Colorado blue spruce that we have planted in ornamental settings the year prior to seeing it in the, um, in the wider forest. So we kind of use that as sort of a canary in the coal mine when we start to see those color blue spruce, we know that we're gonna have some activity in the forest. And there they are, egg masses and larvae all over. Sometimes we'll see them with spruce budworm and looper all in the same tree. I find it exciting, but as a landowner who doesn't wanna have all of that frass and hair and mess, it's not as exciting. And here's the impact, pretty, pretty intense defoliation. Those green trees are pine. Sometimes you'll see a green tree that's a dug fir that's not defoliated at all. And that's a good indication that that tree has some sort of resistance. Just like with bark beetles, you really wanna think about what is your long-term goal with, um, with your forest and what are you gonna to do to manage these defoliators? And again, you can do some stuff with veg management. Um, it's a little bit less of an impact um, or a little bit less of a, a different way of using it as a tool than with bark beetles, and I'll talk about it. And an insecticide you can use to kill the insects directly. So again, with silver culture, we're gonna, the aim is to make it a single story canopy so that you're interrupting that dispersal, that up and down dispersal. And you wanna thin the stands to increase the vigor. And so you may still have your trees totally defoliated um, by the outbreak. But what the, the hope is that once the outbreak subsides, that those, trees will have enough resources to rebound when they're not being defoliated. And again, you wanna hang on to those trees that are superior. Like if a tree looks really vibrant and green, probably has some defense mechanism innate to it. And then also keep in mind that as we talked about in the very beginning, forests are dynamic. So you can do a beautiful treatment. Um, and then 10 years later, or maybe even less, you're gonna have to go back in and do an intermediate treatment as well because the forest will keep growing in. You can also do some direct control. Um, it can be an immediate halt uh, with insecticides to the outbreak. Um, it's short term, especially with spruce budworm, that they just fly right back in the next year. And it's really particular to your individual situation and which insect you're dealing with. The timing is really important. With spruce budworm, I find it really difficult to advise on the timing um, just because um, like a north aspect, the timing for the insect development will be different than on a, a south aspect. And so sometimes you have to do two applications. And I usually recommend BTK if possible. It's a bacterial insecticide and it's really specific to butterflies, moths, and skippers um, versus you know, killing all the insects. And you have to make sure you use the K. I know a lot of um, folks who treat mosquitoes are used to BTI, which is Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, which is for flies. This is um, Bacillus thuringiensis kerstaki, the K is for um, the moths, butterflies, and skipper. There's also BTT, which is for um, other beetles. And then in the case of Doug Fertesic moth, NPV we, is really the 
the most common control mechanism. And it's naturally building up in the population. And then by about three years, the population crashes. And that's that's a kind of a blurry picture, but I, I kind of like it because it's really classic. They just kind of, they get goopy and they just kind of lay over. Um, and it truly happens in Missoula. I just did a survey and there was NPV in just most of the, uh, the larvae I was looking at. Um, and so that's what's pretty effective in controlling those outbreaks. Those of you who are living up kind of, you know, Jetty Lake and Columbia Falls and Kalispell, you see this, you see like, oh my gosh, there's this huge outbreak happens for like a year or two and then there's not much left. And that's why this is what, what gets it. I have no idea how I am on time. I'm sorry to say, um, Abby, I hope you're going to tell me if I have like 10 minutes left. Um, but I'm going to jump in and talk about root disease now. And root disease, we don't talk about root disease much, right? Like you don't get a lot of newspaper articles on root disease, but you hear about fire and bark beetles, but actually root disease is a huge impact on Montana forests and really shapes them. Um, and so it, um, like approximately 3 million acres a year, we have trees dying from root disease. And it's really a disease of the site. Once there's root disease on a site, it's on the site. It's like, you're not gonna be able to take care of it. Fire doesn't get deep enough to kill it. Um, and it's just going to continue to grow. Um, then you'll have chronic mortality and stages of mortality, stems break, trees blow down, and it requires pretty intensive management. And it's really related to the composition of the species that are on the stand. So a lot of times you'll see the crowns thinning from within, and I should put a good picture in here. I'm sorry I don't have it, but the, you know, the, it's like the outside of the tree looks okay, but just near the bowl of the tree, it's kind of looking a little skimpy. That's often from root disease or some sort of root damage. You'll get stress um, cones, like these cones that just kind of come out where it's like, you know, they're not very good cones. It's just like the tree's last chance at putting out seed. You'll get some basal resinosis. I may have a picture of that, I think, um, where you have pitch at the base of the tree. Now be sure it's not just because you backed your RV into the tree or whatever happens, because trees can pitch for a lot of reasons. But if you're seeing that just out in the forest, it very well could be a root disease issue. And in some, especially in our malaria, you can pull back the bark at the root um, or at the root collar and find like a mycelial fan. It's like a fibrous material. It's almost like a chamois cloth that's underneath the bark. And the trees are oftentimes chlorotic and just sort of yellow off color. Something's just not right about it. And sometimes you can see these beautiful concentrated patterns where it's like a um, a dense center and then it spreads out from there. But sometimes also it's just dispersed and you just have to kind of pay attention to what disease, which trees are being affected. So <clears throat> in the case of our malaria, it's really common that it hits like dug fir or true firs first. And that's where you'll see the mycelial fans. They're most susceptible. Those trees are most susceptible to our malaria. Ponderosa pine and larch, not so much. So if you have a stand where you're kind of battling our malaria, the really the best thing to do is start thinking about what species of trees you can switch to. Can you promote larch? Can you promote pine, lodgepole pine, ponderosa pine? That's usually your best bet. There's heterobacidian. Some of you may know it as anosis, and the P type is um, ponderosa pine. And there's some treatments you can do after you cut in your ponderosa pine. You can spray, put um, um, a borate compound on the base of the trees on the cut to keep from spores from going in and getting into the root system. Schweinitzii, brown cubicle rot, is in dug fur. Um, you'll get some clubbed roots and you'll see some cow pie fungi. That's, I don't use that necessarily as an indicator. Usually if some trees around there have that brown cubicle rot inside, it looks like little squares where it crumbles. It's a good indication that's on the stand and that you probably have it in other places. And the club roots are pretty damaging because then they can fall over pretty easily. Tomatosis is often is, is in spruce, and that's a, in the picture is spruce that was impacted by um, tomatosis. Unfortunately, that was in a campground, which is a bad mix. Root disease in campgrounds are, is not ideal. Um, but in this case, for generally speaking, you're gonna wanna promote the non-host. And here's just root diseases that, across Montana and the counties in which they're most common. And the reason I put this up is just to indicate like, wow, look at the Northwest part of the state. It's a good place to host a root disease workshop and it's a good place to, as a landowner to know which root diseases might be impacting your sand. There are also some foliar diseases. Um, foliar diseases are really influenced by the weather. So a wet, 
cool, wet spring. We're going to see a flush of root dis um, foliar diseases. A lot of times they're not too damaging as long as they're not chronic. You know, it can set the tree back a little bit, but sometimes the trees reflush. Um, and so there's not often long-term impact. Um, it can be really alarming because there's quite a pulse of activity. And it can also resemble a bunch of other things as well. So it's good to ID. And sometimes it's a relief once you identify what you have going on. Rhabdoclime is a really common one with Doug fir, and it makes the needles look kind of rusty. Um, it makes the cr tree crowns look kind of thin and scorched. Um, but it has these really distinct red blotches on the underside. There are also some larch needle diseases, and this is really common in the northwest part of the state. Um, there are a couple of different ones. There's Maria, which casts the needles, and then there's Hyperdomella, which is a blight where they just kind of hang on and they're gr pretty gray. But the trees just refoliate typically the next year. Um, you'll see some um, of the, bore, the spores on those needles on the bottom. That's for the Hyperdomella. And the blotchiness on the ones that are standing upright, that's for the cast. But there's also some insects as well. There's some sawflies, and then also there's large case bearer. In this picture, the large case bearer has that little, little cigar shaped thing. It's the case bearer actually goes into that case, hollows it out and kind of wears it like an armor. And um, in this case too, this is one of those things you can't really diagnose while you're you know, cruising by in your car, you have to stop and get out. But once you stop and get out and look at the different uh, issues, it's pretty easy to tell. The management's the same. The management is like, hope it just is better next year. I put Diplody in here because this is kind of an issue up on um, um, Kings Point, is that what it's called? Um, just north of Polson, there was a lot of Diplodia up there. It's Ponderosa pine and it gets into the in expanding candles. And you can see a lot of shoot dieback um, and you can find the fruiting bodies on the cones. This can be a little bit tricky to identify because, oops. Yeah, because there's Western gall rust as well. I can, Cover that later. Western gall rust are those nodules um, where in the they can have that really uh, bright, it looks like Cheeto dust on the ball, the nodule, um, and that's actually a disease. The disease itself doesn't kill the branch, but insects get in there and girdle around. And a lot of times insects and rodents really um, feed around rusts and cankers because um, there's a kind of a carbohydrate concentration and they're sweet. And so you'll get some insects in there that will um, feed and girdle and then that branch tip will die. You can also get it in the main, this is Western gall rust and you can get in the main stem of the tree and then the tree grows around it and creates what's called a hip canker and it's a pretty weak point. So if you have one of these near a structure, um, it'd be valuable to get rid of it just because that is a weak point. And you can see significant crown loss, especially between gall rust and diplodia the, tr the crowns can get pretty bad. And a lot of people mistake it for um, a bark beetle, but it's actually their diseases. Dwarf mistletoes. Uh, east side of Flathead Lake is a showcase of dwarf mistletoe. There's quite a bit of it there. Uh, most species in Montana have it. We don't have it in Ponderosa Pine, but you'll find it in Lodgepole Pine. Western Larch has one, Doug Fir has one. Um, and so you get these really dense brooms and it's this parasitic plant and you can actually see the plants. That picture on the bottom is, is pretty common. Um, sometimes you have to get close up and look and just kind of train your eyes to see it and then you'll see it more commonly. But those heavy, heavy brooms are what kind of grow on those trees. Um, and those brooms can get pretty heavy and when they get snow load on, they can break off and it can just really draw nutrients away from the tree and the tree can get pretty marginalized. And those have seeds that they just rain down onto the regen. So it can be like 30 feet that they'll just spray onto the understory and infect the understory as well. So if you're going to manage it, you really need to get rid of those infected trees. Um, you can girdle it because it, the plant needs or the mistletoe needs to um, grow on a live tree. So you can just go in there and girdle it and create a wildlife habitat. Um, and you really need to get rid of any of the regen underneath that may be infected um, by like 30 feet clearance. Um, and then maybe consider promoting a non-host tree in areas where there is a lot of dug fir dwarf mistletoe. A lot of times your best bet is just to lean towards pine or larch. 
There's a lot of other stuff too that can look like insects and diseases. Again, storms, wind throw, uh, winter desiccation can happen. Drought is a really big one. I've been seeing some drought impacts um, where people are assuming it's a root disease or a bark beetle. And in fact, it's just that soil temperatures are too high. Um, chemicals, this is a picture of a chemical damage. Um, it kind of, with a chemical damage in the roots, it kind of spirals up and looks like a barber pole. Um, you can also have curling and a lot of um, herbicide injury on the needles that can show up. Dust abatement, mag chloride, which is used for dust abatement, can be pretty damaging when it's taken up by the tree roots. And then also physical damage. Um, trees can only take so much tying hammocks up or, you know, signs or fences and stuff like that can be pretty damaging to trees. And with that is my acknowledgement. Oops. So Katie McKeever and August Kramer have helped with some of that in past presentations. And then I use forestry images, which is a great resource um, for pictures. And I really thank Lake County for hosting this and making it happen. And with that, I'll take questions and I don't know how I am on time. So I left my phone in the other room and I have no clocks anywhere. <laughs> No worries, Amy. I just wanted to say thank you so much for spending your time with us tonight mm -hmm. and uh, teaching us about all sorts of things. I feel like I learned a lot. Oh, um, yeah, no, you're actually perfect on time. I was oh. just about to give you a five minute warning. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so yeah, you're golden. Yeah. Um, and we do have a few questions in okay. the Q&A box, um, which oh, I see if it. you hover. Yep. Oh, nice. Awesome. Okay. Oh, okay. So one of the questions is that the beetles are not flying for very long. And so how long do the bubble caps emit pheromones? And it depends on which bubble cap you're buying, but I think it's a typically about 80 days, which is plenty. It's perfect. Um, so the beetles will fly maybe for about two, two weeks or so. I keep seeing the chat lighting up. I'm not sure what that is, but anyhow, um, yeah, so that's why we, we stick them up. You don't want to stick them up too soon because if they emit pheromones, you know, if you hang it up too soon, then your pheromones all dried up before um, the beetles are flying. Yeah, and just to let you know, the chat box is just folks saying thank you. Oh, and that's then nice. asking where the, yeah, and asking where the recorded version of this will be, which I'll let them know. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's see. Bubble claps are so cool. How new is this technology? You know, I don't know how new it is. I've been doing this for about, I don't know, 16 years. And so it's long before it's been, it just gets better and better and better. Um, I don't know how long the technology has been around, but when I started, you couldn't get MCH caps because it was the registration for the EPA was only that a government employee could purchase it, I believe. I may be telling some non truths right now, but. So I would get a grant from the Forest Service and I would buy 17,000 bubble caps and then I would give them away. Um, but now the EPA registration has changed so that people can buy them directly. And how prevalent are the beetles in this area? Are the beetles damaging forests more often now due to how dense our forests are? Um, Sarah, you're asking great questions. Um, so the Bark beetles, they vary. So right now, mountain pine beetle isn't that much of an issue. Um, it's kind of waned. Um, dug fir beetle is more of an issue and they're, it's quite prevalent in the forest right now. And there's some other ones as well, fur engraver, quite a bit of fur engraver in the forest. And some of that is due to the density. I would say more though than bark beetles um, having an issue with are being prevalent, but due to the density is a lot of the defoliators like tussock moth and spruce budworm. Um, the dug fir is shade tolerant, so it can grow up in an undisturbed stand, whereas ponderosa pine and larch cannot. So we are seeing more and more issues with dug fir, but partly because we are seeing more and more dug fir on the landscape. A lot of the times when I make management recommendations to deal with these insects, really it's to kind of kick back the dug fir or open it up a little bit and either give the you know older dug fir a little bit more of a growing opportunity or create um, a growing environment for larch or ponderosa pine. Um, and, you know, some of the bark beetles as well has to do with the age, so like mountain pine beetle, like it was an outbreak in around Butte, but it was just a homogenous stand of trees that were 80 to 120 years old, pure lodgepole pine. It was like an endless buffet for the beetles because um, they prefer those 80 to 120 year old trees, mountain pine beetle. Doug for beetle likes it a little bit older. Um, 
And so having just that uninterrupted food source and not having, you know, a mosaic of younger trees, older trees, different species is kind of precarious. And I only spoke about, for the most part, I only spoke, spoke about insects and diseases that are native to Montana forests. Um, there is white pine blister rust, which is quite detrimental to five needle pines, limber pine, white bark pine, western white pine. It's a non-native invasive disease. Um, and so that one is quite detrimental. And I did not speak of that due to the time constraints. Large case bearer actually is also non-native and invasive, but well, non-native. But um, there was a parasitic wasp that was introduced to control it. And so now it acts a bit more like a native insect. So it, you know, it has predator prey complexes. And so it goes through outbreaks and then the parasitic community um, builds up and controls it. So are there more questions? And you can buy bubble caps locally. Um, you can buy them. It's, it's easy enough to buy them online. All the companies distribute them. So there's Chemtika and there's Synergy. Those are the two biggest ones that I know of that are producing it. You can buy from a local distributor in Missoula. You can also buy from group purchases and you can um, buy, so Chemtika distributes through Dillon distributors in Montana. You can buy through the Swan Valley Connection group purchase if you're interested. And you can also get them at some home and garden and ranch stores as well. I'm not positive, I haven't seen them lately at ACE, but typically when the outbreak is pretty intense, you can buy just bubble caps at your local ACE. And they're pretty competitively priced. They're about, they're similar to if you get them online. Last time I checked that anyhow. And, oh, Patrick, good question. Western pine beetle versus um, let's see, Western pine beetle from mountain pine beetle. How do I, how do I get out of my, I am gonna go, I'm gonna show, can I show a quick picture? Sure. Of Western pine beetle? Cause I kinda, it was a little bit of a heartache when I didn't show that one. <laughs> I have to admit. Um, Look at all of my presentations. You guys can take your pick of what you want to see. Oh no. Just to let you know, we can just still see uh, your PowerPoint, not in slideshow form. When you're ready oh, to share okay. the photo, you'll have to share your screen again and click on the new thing. Um, wait, can you tell me that one more time? I, I can stop, do I stop share and now share? Yeah, you can stop share or you can just share your screen. Oh, again. I see. Mm -hmm. Here we go, Patrick. You ready? Good question. Um, that right there is the, this gallery is the Mount, uh, Western Pine Beetle Gallery. See how circuitous it is? And then Mountain Pine Beetle is that long linear one. And you have this like little crook down at the bottom. You don't need to see that. Oh, and my computer is about to die. So I am sorry if I lose you guys. I've been having computer problems. My battery is um, at the end of its life, I think. No worries. Thanks for giving us a heads yeah. up. Happens at the OK, there we go. I think I plugged it in. Anyway. I'm trying to figure out, oh, oh, it seems like, are there no more questions? No, yeah, you finished all the questions. So Amy, thank you so much for your time this evening and showing us all these wonderful photos. I feel like it made it way easier to understand all of this. And there's just some more folks in the chat saying thank oh. you. and. I know um, Sarah was at the brewery, oh. so a lot of those questions come in and were probably from folks oh, live. Oh, I was like, Sarah, um, you're so asking you. such great questions. I mean, I'm sure she was here, but yeah, it's good <laughs> to know that she was at the brewery. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then, so once again, yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, this, uh, for everyone watching, 
this webinar was recorded and we'll be uploading it live to Lake County Conservation District's YouTube. Uh, so you can find that um, from our website or we'll probably share the link as well on our Facebook page. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone. Was helpful. Have a wonderful We'll do it in person sometime. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. bye.